Today's episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast is brought to you by Poor Richard's Cafe and Star Local Media. Poor Richard's Cafe, Plano's oldest restaurant since 1973. They are open daily from 5.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., serving the three most important meals of the day, breakfast, lunch, and dessert. It is true Texas homestyle cooking made with love and grit at his Poor Richard's Cafe, located off of Avenue K in Plano. Welcome to another episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. My name is Matt Welch. I'm the sports editor at Star Local Media, and I am being joined by Taylor Raglan and Kendrick Johnson. Gentlemen, we are uh, right up against the midpoint in district play for um, for a lot of our baseball districts, so uh, let's take stock in just what we've seen during these first uh, these first few weeks of district play. Um, we're going to have uh, the three of us kind of offer up a, a bit of a mid-district breakdown from a couple of our districts, and then we'll bring on Justin Thomas, Brian Murphy, and Devin Hassan to touch on the first half happenings in their uh, respective areas so um, with the three of us it only makes sense to start over in district 96a as we will be one to do on this podcast so um as a quick update on where these standings are at right now as we um so everybody's played three full-on you know home and home series we're recording this on monday so we're about to um you know embark upon the fourth week of district play but through three weeks so far you have allen all in first place at six and oh you have prosper and mckinney boyd tied for second at five and one then you have plano and jesuit Tied for a fourth at three and three, Plano West in sixth at two and four, and then Plano East and McKinney tied in seventh place at zero and six. So um, if I'm just looking, um, you know, at the uh, kind of the layout of this district so far, um, let's start with McKinney Boyd, Kendrick. You know, McKinney Boyd is a team that I think we, um, you know, we, we felt like they had a chance to um, to be one of the better teams in this district, be in that upper echelon. And through three series, um, they have certainly looked the part. I'll be coming off a very very uh, wild and crazy <laughs> series with Plano West. <laughs> They looked the part. More importantly, they're getting the results. Like last year, I know they were a playoff team, but they lost. Like they lost a. Nah, I don't know about the about the controversy. They lost a similar game last year mm -hmm. to West, and they ended up hurting them because they ended up getting the tiebreaker and they got a lower seed in the playoffs. So, in this district, all as, as the rapper J Rock says, says all you do is win. That's all you can do mm -hmm. in this district because one game can be the difference between playing in second place or not making the playoffs. They've been really solid. Um, Basically, with the offense, um, I looked at their scores on Game Changer. They've scored double figures three times in this district, which is hard to do. Yeah. And <laughs> more importantly, they've won eight out of the last nine, nine games overall. This week coming up will be a definitely a uh, litmus test. The quote the old school guys is they have to play Prosper, who mm -hmm. can, who's come in. So I'm way more talented than them, but that's why we play the game. So yeah. we'll find out what's happening and uh, what happens with Boyd. But um, I think they, they look the part of a playoff team. They do what they have to do to win. Like one game it might be to get, they're going to have to get double figure points. They do that. If they get in the pitcher's duel, they can cut it down to um, – do the little fundamental station to station. Mm -hmm. uh, I must all give um, props to um, Chad um, Brown, who's um, their first baseman pitcher. He's been their ace pitcher and has set that tone. And also Tyler Collins, who is one of the most electric center fielders in the state. I challenge you to go see this kid. If you're a real baseball <laughs> fan, you can tell this kid has the five tool this that they do. Every time I see him play, even he, he's, I've seen him go 0 for 4, but then throw out two people at the plate. He has an impact on the game and he jumps out at you. So that's the way to phrase that. I I challenge you to go see Tyler Collins. <laughs> I double dog dare you to go watch this kid play. <laughs> you on Taylor? You know you just saw Boyd. Um, mm -hmm. You know last Tuesday against so Plano West, <laughs> a game that certainly did not lack for uh, for controversy at the yeah. very end. What were um, yeah? Just what were your initial impressions on McKinney Boyd? And just I guess you can even segue this into a little bit of Plano West talk and sizing up the Wolves. Well, my my first impression was I really liked Chad Brown's outing. Mm -hmm. um, you know he drew Jack Hatcher uh, that Tuesday game that I saw, which is. You know, arguably the premier arm uh, in the district among you know the Brett Tanksleys and, and some other guys, but you know the six six eight pitcher of the year last season. So certainly uh, doing something right and, and going to Baylor. So you know it was um, you know uh, Brown stuff. Um, you know he was a little bit more hittable than Hatchup. Hatchup's a guy that is liable to go out and, and throw seven and give up two hits and maybe an earned run and, and get out of there. Brown, I think, scattered like ten hits, but still a, a really good outing. Um, you know, only gave up the the one run, I believe. Um, uh, one or two, I think it was two runs, but either way, a really good outing. Ended up getting the win with the crazy walk-off controversy that that um, that you saw, and I detailed uh, in my story. We don't have to, to get into it too much, but um, you know, the the bottom line is that you know that was a game that 
you know, West needed. I think the one that they lost, especially, um, you know, on Tuesday with that walk off, um, with that Jack Hatrip start, because now, you know, two and four is, is, is hugely different even than three and three at this stage. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Plano and Jesuit at three and three, um, West at two and four, and, and like Kendrick was saying, that's you know that's one game can be the difference between getting left out or, or making the postseason. So you know it, it's going to be a little bit uphill for West. Um, it seems like they're they're really reliant on on Hatrip. Um, you know their other starter, Luke Douthit, is is another senior. He's totally serviceable. I, I, I mean he's got a good arm. Um, he's a righty. He he puts him in a position to win. I think what's kind of been letting uh, the Wolves down thus far is their bullpen. Mm. Um, you know Clark. Uh, we've, we've spoken a little bit, head coach Kevin Clark, about he's not hesitant to go to the bullpen, but at the same time, <laughs> he, his starters have been stretched and extended a little bit because the bullpen hasn't been as consistent as they expected. Um, with Danny Davis, the quarterback, uh, he's out there in the bullpen. A couple other guys hasn't been quite you know, up to snuff and, and what they expected going in, so it's put a little bit more pressure sometimes on, on Hatrip and Douthit. And, and like I said, Douthit's perfectly serviceable. He's a good second starter for that team, but at the same time, you know, when he starts getting into the trouble in the fifth or the sixth, you have to be able to go to somebody in, in this district that can kind of carry the torch and not, you know, give up three runs and, and blow the whole thing. So um, I think they're talented. I think their lineup is vastly different <laughs> than it was a season ago because they lose a lot of um, kind of wall bangers, big bats uh, at the top of the order and kind of turn into a team that wants to manufacture runs, play a little bit of small ball, one of the fastest teams Clark said he's ever had. So they're, they're certainly still in the mix. They're, sur you know, they're, they're right in the middle. They're not 0-6 like the East and the McKinney's there's there's you know time left for them to kind of climb back into the picture but you know it's going to take some some non-Jack Hatrip efforts from this point forward to to kind of leapfrog back mm -hmm. into that postseason conversation I think for them. A team like uh, Allen which through three weeks has been you know they're the only undefeated team left in the district um, now, like I said the way the district schedule is structured it's the home and home series so yep. it's not like they've beaten every team once you know and <laughs> we're, um, you know, we're about to learn quite a bit about Allen in these, in these weeks data. to come. Yeah yeah so, um, so right now I mean I've got to see Allen a couple times and it's I mean it's a team that's still a they're still a playoff team for sure I mean they've they certainly fit the profile of what has been to this point one of the better yep. teams in this district. I, uh, I'm really impressed with just their patience at the plates. A team that's really good in how they approach it and just drawing walks and stuff. And they um, they do play really solid defense behind you know the uh, the the reliable one-two punch of, of Brett Tanksley and Sean McVitie has emerged as a really capable Friday starter for them. And that's a good. I mean, to already have that locked down at this point. And because there are some other teams that are still kind of working through the you know the kinks as far as who they're as far as, they're, high. as, far as who that yeah that Friday starter is going to be or whatnot. So to have you know for Allen to be able to turn to you know Tanksley and video and know what they're going to get it's pretty it's nice to at least have that you know have that resolved um you know i the lineup has kind of been in flux for much of the district schedule but they do have a top four that is kind of set in stone and pretty established of cooper husband um you know sam hagwood joey chrissy grayson colthorpe colthorpe and um i mean that's about as solid a top four as you're going to find in the district as far as guys that you just you know what you're going to get and can consistently kind of set the tone for their lineup but like i said we're going to learn about them a lot more in the coming weeks because yeah, up to this point up to this point, yeah. So they've, they're six and zero. The combined record of the three teams that they have swept, though, is three and fifteen. <laughs> you know, series against Plano, McKinney, and Plano East. Again, you play, you play, and whatnot. But you still have now the Prospers, the Jesuits. You know, they, yep. so they play this week. They play Jesuit, then they play Boyd, Prosper, Plano West to round it out. Those four so teams. I for long, so you say other people have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> Those four teams have combined fifteen and nine. So um, yes, we'll we'll learn a bit more as far as where Allen ranks, as far as if they are in fact the best team in the district as you know as the record with state right now or just kind of where they fit because yeah the district schedule is about to ramp up in earnest for allen in the uh, in the weeks to come you know I, I mentioned that uh you know it's good for uh it's a good it's good that allen has its you know tuesday and friday starting spots locked up and you look at a team like plano now which mm -hmm. is i mean plano is um th they've played six district games at the time of this recording they've had five different starting pitchers yep. <laughs> across oh. those uh, across those six games so it's whether it's being injuries or whatnot yeah. they just have not um you know just it's kind of muddied the uh, the equation there as Plano's still trying to find some uh, you know some consistency within its rotation you know it does look like they've you know, settled on a uh, Mac Cheney who's thrown mm -hmm. these last uh, these last couple Tuesdays and done solid um, you know Plano has a uh, they've they've broken even to this point they're three and three tied with Jesuit for fourth place um, and there was a kind of an unorthodox schedule in which they started zero and three pretty rare that you see Plano starting zero and three given how consistently strong they've been over the years but they did get things together with you know as you saw yep. against Plano West a wild extra innings victory and 
then um, they were able to sweep McKinney. Um, the offenses started to kind of come to life for Plano. They're averaging uh, 5.7 runs per game over their last three um, versus just three runs per game during the district losing streak. You look like you have something to say. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> that looks more like. How much do you think in this district that we saw it last year that depth's going to play, like in the old 6 6 a that depth's going to play because that's how Allen prevailed. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the deeper your team is, like you hear about, we got this sophomore that's coming along and it's like, when is he going to show and he'll show up in game 15 and get a yeah. big hit. Do you think something like that it's with these rosters is going to determine who, who – who goes where and all that when it's all the, said and done? The impression that I get with this district, and it's it's the same impression that I had with six and say last year, is that it's just all about the arms. It's all about what you can run out there Tuesday and Friday to start, mm -hmm. you know, to, to begin with, uh, for lack of a better word, and then also, you know, the bullpen. And I think that's where the depth comes in. Because, you know, when you build a, a, a team in this district um, at the 6A level, one of the best districts in the state, they can all hit, mm -hmm. but... You know, the arms are certainly the class, I think, of this league, and, it, and it's going to come down to who can string together, especially late in the season, you know, the most quality starts in a row. And, and it, it starts with guys like Jack Hatcher and Brett Tanksley and, and Chad Brown even, and, and guys like that. But, you know, as we've alluded to several times, it's all about that second starter. It's all about what happens, mm -hmm. you know, in the sixth inning when your starter runs out of gas. Who do you go to? So, I mean, it's... It's it, and that's kind of Plano's turnaround. You mentioned 5.7 runs per game. When you're you know gluing a, a pitching staff together, you know with with hope basically, and then trying to find somebody to go on Fridays, the best way to, to go about that is is you know to, to score a little bit on the other side. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I think who wins this district especially is going to come down to who continues to have arms that perform and perform and perform. Even though Brian Murphy isn't here to you know to truly delve into Prosper and whatnot, that was the team that we felt like at least judged on our preseason prediction was going to be the uh, at least our predicted district champion. Yeah, They're 5 yeah, and 1. They did get tripped up against Jesuit, you know, their first loss in quite a while yeah. last Friday. Um do we still feel like though the Prosper is oh, yeah. kind of set in stone I, as the I saw them play against front McKinney High in the first um, series. I know I'm um, high struggling, but they just came and shut them down. Their um, number 2 guy threw a one hitter and had 14 Ks, but um I've said this before with um, Coach Rick Carpenter. That guy, like, he didn't know that he was, uh, quote unquote, a living legend. He just has that swag, mm -hmm. like, I got this. We're going to be okay. So, following his lead and with the talent that they got, Possible's not going anywhere. Before we, um, before we uh, you know, shift gears and bring on the other uh, the other guys, do want to quickly touch on a couple of our 5A districts. Oh, okay. um, let's start with quickly, Taylor. Let's delve into Lake Dallas for a sec. Um, sure. Just any, uh, you've seen them a couple times. I mean, mm -hmm. the initial commentary on what you've seen out of the Falcons, who um, were expected to be one of the better teams in District yep. 8 5A. Yep. I think I had them, you know, in our predictions, winning the district. Um, they're 4-2 and two right behind Denton uh, so far. Uh, Ryan Deppersmith has been rock solid um, as the Friday guy. He's been their Friday starter. Uh, they've kind of pieced together mm. their Tuesdays a little bit, like a lot of other teams in the area. Yeah. Um, but between you know guys like Cade McCollum, um, a couple other guys that the Ben Price I think ran out there one game. Uh, they they've been you know able to to more than make it work. Um, like I mentioned, four and two in district, all alone in second place right now. It's a little bit of a weird district because teams are getting entire bye weeks yeah. <laughs> because it's a you know it's <laughs> like like next week Lake Dallas will have Little Elm who had their bye week they're three and one Lake Dallas is four and two you know so that'll maybe cause some juggling I mean we'll see but um yeah I mean Lake Dallas top to bottom brought back a ton from the lineup they can really hit um you know they they lost six four to to uh didn't Braswell last Tuesday came out and run rolled him Friday behind Depperschmidt. Um, I don't remember what the final score was, 14 to four, I believe it was. Um, they just went off, really hit the ball well, really stayed on top on a night when <laughs> the wind was blowing out hard. So it, you know, as from experience, those are the nights that are the hardest to kind of really stay within yourself and stay on top and and kind of do what got you to that point. And, and they were able to do that. So and you know, the run rule victory means that. You know, Depper Schmidt with the new pitch limits and everything that's you know involved in the UIL. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity for him to close Tuesday, still be able to go Friday. I mean, it, it opens up a lot of things, especially for a huge series against Little Elm. But um, pretty much doing what I expected. You know, they they hit the ball really well. Depper Schmidt is is a gamer on the mound. Um, gives you you know five, six, seven innings every single outing. Has really good stuff. Um, and and I expect them to continue to to be right there at the top and in the mix for the uh, for the 5 a title. I wonder what, because I think of this like with a team like Jesuit back in 9-6-A, a team that, you know, you see a lot of, you know, a lot of teams will throw their ace mostly on mm -hmm. Tuesdays, but it does feel like Lake Dallas is kind yep. of, you know, uh, you zig where other teams might zag. Yep. They've now 
for <laughs> Devil Pepper Schmidt on uh, on Fridays. You yep. see that like with a team like Jesuit, who's undefeated on Fridays, yep. versus you know being zero and three on on Tuesdays. Yep. Um, what do you think goes into a decision like that to throw someone like Depper Schmidt on Friday versus Tuesday when normally you, know, you see a lot of aces being you know, tossed out there? I don't think a whole lot goes into it. I mean, I guess if you really want to try to play like you know Galaxy Brain Chess, you could say that you're going to line up your ace against a guy that you know maybe isn't the other the other team's mm. number two and try to win that battle, um, and then trust your offense and whoever else you can kind of run out there on yeah. Tuesday to, to try to get you some wins early in series. Um, and then, you know, if you if you do end up so lucky as to have a, a, an outing like Debersman had last Friday, then you can use them on Tuesday as well. But I don't think there's a whole lot that goes into it. I think that it's just, you know, how the how the dominoes fall. And some guys do have preferences. I mean, I don't I don't know if Debra Schmidt's one of those guys, but I don't think anything super special goes into it. I guess, like I said, maybe um, some coaches use it as a way to try to get better matchups on the mound. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I think it's it's kind of uh, I don't want to say meaningless, but you know, when whenever you run your number one out there, it, whether it's Tuesday or Friday, you're trying to win that ball game, and then the other <laughs> the other day is the one where you you patch things together and, and try to get your offense to show up a little more. So for whatever reason, Coach Ryan Howard over there at Lake Dallas runs you know Ryan out there on Fridays, and and that's the way it goes, and and you just kind of get in a rhythm regardless. So I don't I don't think you know that it's it's super strategic in any way. I think that's just the day that. You know, they decided it was Deborah Schmidt's day. Maybe he's just used Fridays with football. Maybe that's it. <laughs> that's his time to shine. Yeah. Uh, shine. Uh, let's see, over in District uh, 10 5A, you guys got a couple programs there. Kendrick, you with McKinney North, and Taylor, you with Lovejoy. This district is operates at a little bit of a different kind of district schedule versus yeah, the others different. because they only have six teams in District 10 5A, so they play a round robin initially, and then they play a series of home and homes. So yep. these teams will all see each other three times. Yep. We'll play a total of 15 district games versus you know the the 10 that you think yeah. of if they just played the normal uh, the normal home and home so uh, yes they've wrapped up i guess the round robin portion of that yep. district and schedule and they've had one series yeah one series yeah. so um so yeah let's uh any initial impressions i know lovejoy and mckinney north are two of the better teams in this district right now uh, you have lovejoy six and one in first place mckinney north is five and two north does have the win over lovejoy though yep. so at least right now some head-to-head bragging rights uh, uh, basically it's um, going to come down to can you win the close games? Like, North's got three 1 1 games, but they got three wins. They put them in the W column when it's all said and done. Because um, one thing, nobody, with this being uh, uh, realignment year, nobody knew how this was going to play out. Yeah. So, um, I think there's a lot of, like Taylor said, 6A um, is about the arms. This one's about the individual talents. Like, there's a couple guys going to big schools, like one guy for Wally East. Who's the guy for Lovejoy? That's pretty good. They, they got stuff. I mean, they got two aces. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure where either one's going. But. Yeah, but, but a player or two like that in this yeah. district can carry you to at least a regional tournament. Would you agree? Yeah. I think that, you know, when it comes to Lovejoy and, and how good they've been, I think just top to bottom, they're they're stacked. I mean, it's just one of those years where they have everything. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, head coach Jason Wilson, when I talked to him before the season, uh, it was actually a couple of games in district play when, when I just uh, checked in with him. He said they've been building toward this for for three years, that these guys were all together as sophomores. It was obvious that by the time they kind of matured and and got into those senior roles, they were going to be special. Um, Everybody's still there, and and they've been building toward this run. I mean, you have Jacob Terwilger and Jordan Yoder on the mound, two bona fide aces. It's not even a one and two. They have a one and a one A. Mm. They're literally, you know, they're both dominant. They bring back Luke Stein, Offensive Player of the Year from last year. Um, You know, Cameron Poole, Luke Finn, Ralph Ruckler, a sophomore who started last season in the outfield. Um, uh, Just everybody. Michael DeFiori, uh, even... You know, Terwilger and Yoder, they both hit, and and it's it's they're just stacked. I mean, that's that's literally the bottom line. McKinney North got them um, in their game. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the score was. Looking Six over, to three. yeah. So I mean, it was. It, it doesn't sound like it was. It was just a good baseball game. I can imagine between those two teams, and and I'm sure those two teams, um, like you said, will be at the top pretty much all season. But as far as Lovejoy is concerned, it's one of those years where you, if they don't make a run to regional tournament regional final like type season then you'll feel like it's a wasted year like they're not just trying to make the playoffs this year they're trying to engineer a run they're trying to capitalize on something that's been kind of in the making for three years now um and and really try to get something going and and i think they have you know high school baseball in general for me has always been about the arms because hitting (laughs) hitting's hard in general and in high school kids it comes and goes it always will um you know there's not a whole lot of teams that are just going to beat beat your brakes off every single game and score 12. (laughs) i mean it's all about the arms and and if you can have a and a yoder you know going through this season into the postseason they're 
in pretty good shape. Yep. Uh, also, being injuries, um, injuries affected any sport, but um, no one's getting back. Cam Constantine signed in Texas, one of the best dual quarterback on the gridiron, but he's also one of the best catchers in the state. So even though he can't play in the field, that's another D1 bat mm -hmm. you got in your lineup that will help out the second round of the district. Yep. That is a look at uh, some of the happenings in our districts. Obviously, still got plenty more to talk about, be it over in Denton County, over in East Dallas County, Frisco ISD, you name it. And we'll bring on Justin, Devin, and Brian in just a moment. But first, got to shine that student athlete spotlight and for that Justin Thomas made a trip out to Marcus to talk with their stud pitcher Blake Mayfield on a, uh, another great year for the Marauders and we will see what he had to say after a word from the sponsor today's podcast is brought to you by Star Local Media 14 newspapers and websites with a print distribution of 270,000 homes and monthly page views of 600,000 online Star Local Media your community voice for news and now, let's get back to the podcast. We are here with Blake Mayfield, senior baseball player for the Marcus Marauders. Blake, thanks for taking a few minutes to uh, chat with us on the Star Local Media Sports Pass this week. No problem. Thanks for having me. So you guys are coming off a big game last night against uh, one of your big district foes, Capella, and you guys got the 1-0 win. Just uh, to get started, just talk about how things played out last night for you guys. You know, uh, well, first of all, Tyler Morgan on the mound, he did a great job, uh, limited damage, didn't really give up many base runners, they only had, I think, two hits, so, and the defense played well behind him. Whenever he uh, pitched and they hit it into play, we made the plays, didn't have any errors, so it was pretty good, credits to him. You guys obviously came out of a strong district last year, um, appears to be much of the same this season. Mm -hmm. Just looking around at scores, you know, you see a lot of really strong pitching performances from a lot of teams. So what's it like just going through this district so far and facing the arms you guys have been seeing? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of good, a lot of good teams this year. A lot of good arms. Um, you know, just every week we got to prepare, get better um, at bats, mainly hitting, and then just trust our pitching and defense to go through these guys. I mean, but there's there's a lot of good arms in this year's district for sure. You guys made it all the way to the regional finals last year and lost to the eventual champs from South Lake. Um, what kind of how did that motivate you guys, and what's kind of the mindset and the expectation of the team coming into this season? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, there's a lot of expectations on us. I mean, the last two years we went four rounds, and then last year the regional finals. Um, but you know, just staying calm and doing our thing every day at practice, and then when we get to the games, just being ourselves and trying to make our own identity, not thinking about last year too much anymore. So just trying to make our own identity. You were named the MVP of the district last year. Obviously, you contribute in multiple ways, pitching and hitting. Is there, a, is there an aspect of the game that you enjoy the most? Pitching, for sure, definitely. Yeah. I love getting out there and competing. I mean, this year we got a great defense behind me, making it, making it a lot easier, so, yeah. Is it something about pitching, just being on the mound and knowing that you're in control? Is that one of the aspects that yeah. you enjoy? Yeah, for sure, just knowing that I'm controlling the game. I mean, and just throwing strikes and trying to get people out, trusting my players behind me. How would you describe yourself as a pitcher? What do you try to kind of? How do you try to approach hitters and attack hitters when you're on the mound? I would say my main focus is just throw strikes and trust my defense behind me and know that if they hit it, they're gonna make a play behind me. So just attack every hitter, as anything. We mentioned uh, the, the run to the regional finals last year, but obviously you guys lost a lot of talented players from that from that squad. Talk about what's a little different about this team and some guys that are uh, new to the varsity that are kind of stepping up for you guys. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we have a very young team this year, a lot of juniors, a few sophomores that are really playing well, stepping up into the roles of the seniors that we lost last year. But yeah, we have confidence in everybody, anybody who we put out there is going to get the job done. Did you and some of the other seniors feel like you kind of had to step up into those leadership roles this season? And how do you feel that's progressing for you guys? I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like every year the senior class needs to step up and lead the guys that haven't played as much on varsity or at all. So it's just big and we've had lots of it, lots of people step up and do their good roles. You guys are sitting at six and one in district right now. How do you feel the, the first half, you, actually right at the halfway point right now, how do you feel it's gone so far? Yeah, I mean, we've played well up to this point. I mean, this is kind of our stretch right here with Capel, Flower Mound, and then MacArthur and Louisville here to end it. And so just gotta keep playing well. I know we're playing, we're doing great on the mound and playing great defense. Just gotta get the bats going a little more and just keep going, keep competing. Obviously you guys are shooting for the playoffs, but I know you have bigger goals than that. What do you think it's going to take for this to be a, what's it going to take from your perspective to be a successful season for you guys this season? Yeah, I mean, as of right now, I mean, we're just going game to game, trying to take it one day at a time. And then, I mean, that all adds up as it goes on. Just make our run. All right. I understand uh, recently you made a, a big decision committing and signing with uh, A&M. Talk about uh, looking forward to being with the Aggies and what was the, the intrigue and 
for them for you? Yeah, I mean, A&M, great coaching staff. It's an SEC, not too far away from home. It's just a great program overall. I love the university, the coaches, and all the equipment that you get there and everything, the resources that you have while you're there. It's fantastic. Do you have any former buddies or guys you play with that are out there or anything? And did oh. they push you, try to push you that way at all? Oh, no, no, not push me that way. I mean, I fell in love with it when I went there. And, yeah. I mean, I got a few good buddies that I know that are in my class and that are freshmen there right now that are doing great. So I'm just ready to get out there. So you're going to be on the mound on Friday to close out the Coppell series. Um, is it challenging for you, or how do you kind of distribute your workload between pitching and hitting? I mean, I just stay relaxed. Just, just do my thing. Just go out there, throw strikes, and trust the guys behind me. And then hitting, you know, just swing at good pitches, yeah. put the ball in play for sure. Does it feel different to you when you're at the plate when you're, you know, pitching and then coming back and hitting versus just being in the dugout waiting for your turn to come to the plate? No, it doesn't, no. It doesn't phase me really. Just either way, just gotta stay focused and focus on the task that I'm trying to complete. Do you feel like you're batting benefits from the fact that you are a pitcher and you maybe kind of thinking about how your opposing pitcher might be working and try to attack you? I mean, yeah, for sure, for sure. If I'm batting in the top of the lineup, I know how I would face guys that are in the Part of the lineup that you know you might be a little more careful with them, pitch better. So, just but still, just attack. Everything's just attacking for me. Just trying to stay focused. All right, Blake. Well, thanks for taking a few minutes to join us on the podcast. And if you guys haven't got a chance to see the Marauders yet, you can check them out uh, Friday at seven o'clock against Capel. Blake, thanks again. Thank you. All right, a big thanks to Blake Mayfield of Flower Mound Marcus. I almost said Baker Mayfield. I was trying to train myself. <laughs> Blake Mayfield. Big thanks to him. Uh, Justin, he's back from doing that interview. He's all over the place. Uh, Justin Thomas, as you already know, our Denton County reporter, Coppell, Louisville, Flower Mound, et cetera, et cetera. Devin Hassan, our Rollett, Mesquite, Saxy sprinkled in there as well. <laughs> Shout out to my alma mater, Saxy. And of course, I'm Brian Murphy, talking anything Frisco, Little Elm, Salina, Prosper, that whole entire area as well. And as you can imagine, <laughs> lots of uh, stuff going on on the baseball diamond uh, with all of our markets, all of our teams. Uh, we're hitting the midway district, the midway point of district, in most of our uh, most of our districts uh, across the area. Uh, some teams have already separated themselves. Some teams have pretty much already eliminated. But let's talk about some of the teams that are you know red hot. You know at you know that some of the teams that we expected. We still have some teams that are undefeated uh, in district play. Uh, how about Saxy? How are they, I, I know they're undefeated out there. And is it 10 6 A now? 10 6 A, yes. Six, eight, yeah. Yes, Saxy is at 6 and 0. Uh, they are the uh, reigning district champions. That's right. And in the driver's <laughs> seat to do so once again. Uh, they have company up there close, though. Rowlett is 5 and 1, as is Name and Forest. Uh, Name and Forest uh, is, did beat Rowlett. That's Rowlett's one loss uh, in extra innings. The game I was actually add up the district opener. Uh, Name and Forest, one loss is to Saxy. And then Saxy and Rowlett actually play. Or play, play tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's a uh, Friday night. Yes. Yeah, gotcha. No, no, yeah. Um, so anyway, Saxy though is, is the team to beat. They've got a really good rotation. Chase Alford, Blaine Chapman have been uh, kind of their Tuesday Friday guys. But David Gonzalez, who was the pitcher of the year last year, um, I believe was injured early on the season. But they've been kind of working him back. He's come on in relief. But he's a guy that. Um, is a seven inning guy. I mean, and he's a legit ace. So you add him to the mix, you got three really solid starters. Uh, they got a good, they're, as a team, they're hitting 308. Uh, Chase Alford uh, leads that group at 410, but you go up and down their lineup. Uh, Chase Cromer and Cameron Cromer and Ty Fairley, Trent Dean, Robert Hine. I mean, all these guys are hitting 300 to 350. Wow. I mean, it's just a, it's a very complete team. Uh, and obviously that's, that shows in their record. Uh, Rowlett, um, Coming off a really nice three to one win over Lakeview, a Lakeview team that actually was undefeated up until last week. They lost their first game to Saxe, and then they lost to Rowlett to drop back mm. to four and two. Uh, but Rowlett's another team that's got a really nice rotation with Cole Maxey and Braden Ferry. Uh, Braden Ferry actually threw no hitters in his first two games of the season this mm. year. Um, Cole Denton's kind of come on as, as, as their relief guy to kind of shut it down in the seventh. Uh, Ethan Green is another kid who can pitch. Uh, and so they're another well-rounded team. Ethan Green was the offensive player of the year in the district last year. Uh, Nick Waite, uh, Hudson Parker's done a nice job in the leadoff spot. So two very well-rounded teams. I, I, I think that Naming Forest is going to have a say in the matter too. Um, but it's going to go down to the wire, like a lot of these races have been. But uh, again, Saxy, especially if they can, you know, if they beat Rowlett, then they have, a, you know, certainly have a huge advantage heading down to the home stretch. And in that so series, that, no, go ahead. 
So that district, you guys don't do series over there? We don't do, well, that, we, we don't, we don't yeah. do series. That's, that's, that's the odd thing. Um, almost every other district has adapted the series mm -hmm, yeah. format. But what it, it allows the teams to do is especially... You get to stagger your number one. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the, these when Rylett and Saxe and Name It Forest play one another, they're getting the best. They're getting the ace, yeah. uh, whereas they don't have to, you know, look at things like a series, like how, you know, it yeah. takes that element of strategy out of it. Especially when you have teams that are struggling, like North Garland, like South Garland, when you can roll, maybe your number three guy out there and save yeah. both your best arms for a Friday game, as opposed to, you know, yeah. So it's yeah, it definitely changes kind of the outlook on how you handle your pitching staff. You got to think that might hurt him come playoff time, though. You know. You know, most teams are experienced in, you know, okay, how do we manage my, our ace? How do we manage our number two? How do we manage number three? That, that kind of deal. Okay, our ace threw 80 pitches Tuesday. We can't throw on Friday. They don't really have that problem, you know, for the most part in, in, in well, the Garland district. And so that might hurt them when, once they, you know, start running into those big-time teams later in the playoffs. Well, and I think they approach it like that, though. But Chris Burrow has been the baseball coach out there. Oh, I've known him for a long they, time. Since they oh, opened. Yeah. Uh, Paul Carmen has been at Rowlett since Rowlett opened. And these guys are, are used to making the playoffs. So they know how to yeah. handle that staff. staff. And uh, that's one of the reasons you'll see from basically this point in the season all the way to the end of the regular season, they also schedule Saturday games. So they have Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, and so they try to treat it as if it's a three-game series gotcha. on how they handle their pitching staff. Okay. Any undefeated teams in district play left in, in your neck of the woods? Flower Mound, alone and mm -hmm. first at 6-0, trying to rebound after missing out on the playoffs last year for the first time ever. Wow. Um, so yeah, Flower Mound 6-0, then you have Marcus and Coppell at 5-1, and one, Hebron 4-2, and two, Louisville 2-4, and four, and then the Irving schools following so I feel like that's been a like common a, theme with been a, the, with it's, been a, it's been a common theme mm -hmm. for the most part um, but I think if there was any sport you would really expect it in it would be baseball with um, you know the tradition of some of these Louisville schools you know even a team like Louisville that's two and four out they appear to be kind of a cut above the Irving schools they, yeah, I was they, about to they say, dominated, pretty much dominated MacArthur sweeping them for their two wins so, so if you're Louisville and you're in most other districts you're you're a, yeah. probably a playoff team, but not in not this, in this a, one. This is a tough one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Flower Mound's in first. Flower Mound hasn't. They've had the without doubt the softest schedule of any of the you know top five teams. They've played Louisville, and then they had Irving and Nimitz. So they haven't mm -hmm. faced Capel, Hebron, or Marcus yet. The two, three, and four teams. Um, whereas the team that you know might be sitting the, I won't say sitting the best, but if you got to be very encouraged is Hebron. Um, Hebron's you know. Alone in fourth, they're four and two. They're a game back of Marcus and Capel. They've already played Capel with Marcus, and they got splits with both of them. <coughs> so if they're playing Flower Mound this week. If they could get another split with Flower Mound, you know, then they're going to close with the three of the lower teams in the district. So gotcha. um, really good start for Heber in getting those splits against Capel and Marcus. You know, those are the only losses that Marcus and Capel have because they've both beat Irving schools as well. Um, so big week this week. You have you know first place Flower Mound six and zero against Hebron, and then you have Marcus and Capel both at five and one squaring off. So Some juicy matchups. Yeah, there. pretty pretty big week in the uh, six six a slate. Um, but yeah, Hebron's the one that's kind of I wouldn't say surprised, but very good start to get those splits with Capel and Marcus. And I know that Marcus series last week in particular was two one run games. So these these games are. Um, not a whole lot separating these four teams, and they each have been yeah. turning out dominant pitching performances. So speaking of undefeated teams, no surprise, Wakeland, <laughs> the class of, of baseball in, in 9-5-A, they're 9-0. I was going to say they've never they played 12 yes. games. Yeah, pr pretty <laughs> much. But yeah, they're right at the midway point because they'll play 18 games at the 10-team district. They're 9-0. Uh, they have a new head coach this year, Daryl Preston. Uh, coach Barry Rose, he's now at Rockwall. Uh, brought his son Barrett Rose with him, who would have been one of the top players on this team. And the fact... You know, to have a new head coach, you know, lose one of your middle of the old batting order guys, uh, you know, still be 9-0. Oh, granted, they, they return a lot of players. They return the pitcher of the year in the district last year in Justin Karbowski. You return the district MVP in J.D. Gregson, who's only a junior now. He won the MVP as a sophomore last year. You know, a bunch of other guys, Trent Worsler, Hayden Foster, Cal Strand, a bunch of starters all across the board, Hunter Pinnell, Tom Hart. Team is loaded, uh, and, they, and they are rolling uh, through the district. A surprise in that district, though, is Independence. Last year, they won three games. This year, they're 7-2. and two. And, you know, I, they did have a little bit of a weak schedule to start off, you know, playing the, the some of the newer teams. Granted, there's Lebanon Trail in there now, Memorial. Memorial's actually 
you know, holding it down a little bit with a three and six record tied uh, in a log jam with three other teams tied at three and six, kind of there in the in the bottom. But you know, you have Lebanon Trail and Independence was picking up wins against those teams. But Lebanon Trail, they've, or Independence, I should say, they've also beaten uh, teams like Heritage. They've beaten teams like Liberty. They're coming off a sweep against Frisco, you know, one of the uh, teams with the richest tradition in in all in that entire district right there when it comes to baseball. So Independence, they're, they're doing something right, rolling at 7-2. At, at, at and two. But Wakeland, once again, you know, as always, the class uh, of that district. Uh, are we going to stick with 5A, or do you still have more 6A teams to talk about? I know you. We mentioned we talked well, about the Garland District, and well, we yeah, I, you know, real quick on 6A, sure. you know, Horn and Horn and Mesquite North Mesquite are probably likely fighting for that final playoff spot okay. out of 11 6A. Uh, Rockwall Heath is kind of oh, the class Rockwall, of that district. Yeah, Rockwall is yeah, a very okay. good. I mean, Rockwall's four and two. They just got swept by Heath. Which obviously gives Heath a leg up. Tyler Lee is a very, very tradition rich program in and of itself. And so, you know, Horn at three and three, uh, North Mesquite at one and three, Mesquite at one and five. Uh, it looks like they're going to be battling Longview for that final playoff spot. But uh, real quick, back and down to, uh, to 5A, you were talking sure. about district undefeateds. Poteet, got to give a shout out okay. to Poteet. They are four and oh. Um, Really, kind of made a statement this past week uh, in their series against North Forney, who came into that came in at four zero, and uh, Potit swept them. Uh, Gilbert De Los Santos threw a no hitter uh, in a Tuesday game. Uh, they kind of went committee on Friday and in thirteen to three wins. Stephen uh, Fink is a, a guy they can turn to on the mound. Jackson Huber, uh, Omar Serna, um, but you know this is a Potit team that had a lot of tradition. A lot of rich tradition. I mean, they made it to the state tournament in 2011, and I think they had a streak of 20 straight. I, I think they made 20 out of 21 years they'd mm -hmm. made the playoffs, but they've only made the playoffs twice since that 2011 drip to the state tournament. So, a, a program that's kind of fallen on some hard times um, of late, but they kind of ran it into form last year late in district. Even when they were out of the playoff picture, they had some really close losses to, mm -hmm. to Forney and, and some really good teams like that. Um, but they closed hot, and that's kind of carried over into this year. They have a lot of those guys back, and uh, obviously sitting there at 4-0. and Forney is still, I think, the class of this district uh, coming off their state tournament appearance yeah. last year. But they lost a lot of pitching. You know, They lost yeah. some studs. So um, Boutique could be. I mean, they, they showed against North Forney that they're they're ready to be a contender, and so I'm really interested to see what happens when those two teams so meet. So Forney's not the lock in this district by any means. No, Forney still got a lot of talent, and they're still the favorite, the preseason favorite, to win it. But they don't have those same Sure. quality of arms uh, that they did last year. Yeah, like I saw them play in that fifth round playoff series yeah, against that Prosper. Mason Engler and, and, and Justin Jonathan Childress. Ch yeah, Jonathan yeah, Childress. Jonathan Childress. And then I can't, I'm blanking on their third starter, but Prosper, they were so you know confident heading into that third game because they already threw out Childress and Engler and Prosper was throwing out their, their number one and then their, their, their third pitcher <laughs> yeah. dominated and you know, they sent Prosper home packing. But yeah, so Oh man! So Prosper was in 5A last year, and you know that's in a, the same district as the Colony. And mm -hmm. Now the Colony shares the same district with Little Elm, Lake yeah. Dallas. What is going on with the Colony baseball? They're a, a weird one to kind of figure yeah. out. Peg, you know, um, got off to like a pretty decent start, getting a split with Little Elm. Mm -hmm. You know, two quality it was two close teams. games yeah. too. And yeah, then, one run games. Yeah, and then they lost two to Lake Dallas, and but those were pretty tight games as well. Um, and you know Lake Dallas Lake looks Dallas like it's team, yeah. probably the class of the district it looks like um, but then really tough week coming back and losing twice to Denton 4 to 3 and 4 to 2 They're so 6 and 0 yeah Denton somehow 6 and 0 I, I mean I haven't <laughs> seen them play I haven't paid attention to them at all yeah, don't know. now my eyes are going to be on them a little bit yeah. but so I mean it's tough to look at the colony yeah. and say hey 1 and 5 but then you know they're 1 and 5 and their five losses are like seven runs total yeah. so they're right there you know, like we said, I don't know a whole lot about the Denton schools and Justin Northwest, so we'll see if they're able to. I'm guessing, you know, facing Little Elm, Lake Dallas, and Denton. I don't. That sounds like the toughest start that anybody in the district True. has had. So they've probably played three of the better teams. So maybe they can get hot. Their pitching's look like it's g going to be pretty, uh, pretty strong. So we'll see if they can get hot and make a run late. But mm -hmm. certainly not the start. But then, yeah, when you look at Denton being six and zero, maybe it's really not that surprising to, to get swept by them. Yeah, and Little Elm, they had a, a bye week, you know, so when you have these series, they had this entire week off, so they played Midlothian just to kind of, you know, keep it keep it rolling a little bit, and they've just been a part of so many one-run games. So they beat Midlothian by one last week. They lost to Midlothian in the second game uh, by one. 
They uh, they beat Denton Broswell in a series two to one, and then one to nothing, and then they had that t super tight series with the oh, Colony. So yeah. they're sitting there three and one. You know they might have you know a contender for district MVP with a guy like you know Ryan Depperschmidt or I, I'm not I don't know if Denton has any studs. If this, yeah. especially if they win the district, they'll be yeah. you know they'll have uh, I know how they like to vote in that district for <laughs> district <laughs> MVPs <laughs> if you finish in first place. But yeah, you know if you have Logan Kohler, <laughs> OU signee, uh, he's kind of gone back from the starter to the kind of their close are more of in a bullpen role uh, you know utility infielder can play anywhere third base shortstop second base he's just an absolute stud bats clean up Jorge Aldrete Jorge Aldrete all-state first baseman a year ago he's a junior now um, little can make could uh, could could do a little damage uh, you know these one run games are kind of scare me a little bit but the fact <laughs> that they've pulled out a lot of them uh, is is a, is a good sign good sign there for uh, for the Lobos and then of course I got to shout out Salina Salina baseball after missing the playoffs last year after the missing the playoffs the last two years I should say they're right there in the thick of things two and two they had a big win last week against Anna uh, uh, Raleigh can't think of the, his last name pitcher from <laughs> no. no no the pitcher from Anna he's a, a sophomore a and commit it was the first time I ever seen him um, Salina rocked him pretty well uh, they, they beat them big win there so they're in the playoff mix in 11 4 a so we'll see uh, if the Bobcats can have a bounce back here finally in 2019. So that'll just about do it uh, with our baseball discussion at the Mid District Point. That's Devin Hassan. That's Justin Thomas. I'm Brian Murphy. Have a good week, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you next week.